much, Brother Herman. Good evening, friends. It's a, another privilege to be here tonight in the service of the Lord to try to do what we can to help the people to know the Lord Jesus better. We've been having a great time this week, if there's some newcomers tonight. We are having uh, just an old-fashioned revival. When I see people walk down the aisle here to accept Christ as their Savior, go in to re- seek and to ask God for deeper walks with Him and to receive the Holy Spirit, that means that there is a revival in the making. So we're thankful, very, very thankful for that. And I'm trusting that the Lord Jesus will bless us tonight exceedingly. Now I want you to remember tomorrow morning's breakfast. I think it's been taken off just for ministers and their wives, but it's whosoever will. And um, somewhere here on the grounds at the school where the breakfast will be. And then immediately after breakfast, I want to to speak, address the the group that's there the, on an evangelistic message. And I would certainly be glad if you could find a time in your schedule, being it's Saturday, if you could just drop in for a few moments and have breakfast with us and listen to the message. And then, uh, uh, then Saturday night, tomorrow night, at regular time, 7.30, I think, is the beginning of the regular service again tomorrow night. And then Sunday afternoon, at 2 o'clock, we're anticipating a, another great rally of praying for the sick on Sunday afternoon, the leaving um, before we leave the city. Thank you for your invitation back. And... I trust that if there be the will of the Lord, I get to come back with you again sometime in a glorious time. Now, I don't want to take too much time tonight. I say that each night. We leave about 10 o'clock or 10.30 or somewhere like that. But you're such a nice audience to talk to. Now, I want, because that tonight we're going to pray for the sick. Of course, each night we have prayed for the sick. I think each night. Now, that we might get a good, clear understanding. And everyone, and I'm, I will ask if you'll be just as reverent and give me your undivided attention. Because sitting here and out in the audience is people that are here. And if they do not get help from God, they're going to be leaving us right away. Now, what if this was your mother laying on this stretcher? What if this was your father sitting in this wheelchair? What if that was your child laying there? You see, you might not believe in divine healing, but... You've never been sick enough yet. You've never had the doctor to shake his head and say, Takes God next. I've done all I can do. You'll believe in divine healing then. So you remember, it's something written in the scripture. If you would spurn him in the days of your health like this, and when your calamity comes, he said, I'll only laugh at you. So it's best to know him now. While you're healthy and mentally right and can walk up to him and accept him and believe his word and express yourself to him. It's best to know him now. That when the hour of trouble comes, he's a very present help in a time of trouble. Now let it be known to everyone that I do not believe that there is such a thing as a man being a divine healer. Whether he's doctor or whether he's a psychiatrist, whatever he is, there's no divine healers. There's only one healer, and that's God. Now, we have doctors and medical institutions and scientists, uh, research and medicine, which we are grateful, and as Christian people, we should not let a day pass without praying for 
the help of those men who are trying to, in research, to find something to help relieve the suffering. I think it's a real thing, a real Christian act for men and women to pray for men uh, to find something or another to help us. Because what if it was you sick? You'd want anything that could help you. Well, then when a person gets to a place that they have, that the doctor can do no more for you, then I think we have a right to call on God, we who believe God. Now, it's undisputed in the scriptures about Jesus Christ and the early apostles. They did, by faith, heal the sick. Jesus claimed that he never healed the sick. He said, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. He does the healing. And I only do as he shows me by vision. Now, any Bible student knows that's true. St. John 5, 19, Jesus never performed one miracle in his life without first God the Father showing him a vision to do it, or he told something wrong in the Bible. Or he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Now, divine healing is not based upon some emotion. It's not based upon some uh, laying on of hands or some strange feeling or sensation. It's based upon a faith in a work that was done for you by Jesus Christ at Calvary. It's a finished product. And every person here tonight that's sick and afflicted, as far as God is concerned, you are already healed. And every sinner here is already saved, for it was finished at Calvary. And now to the deans and teachers of the schools, if the old covenant, the old atonement, included healing, and this is a better atonement than the old one was, how much more has this got healing in it? The Bible said, and Isaiah, that he was wounded for our transgressions, and with his stripes we were healed. Now, Someone tried to speak and say that was fulfilled in Matthew 12 when he said he took upon him the infirmities of us and he healed them that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, he bore our infirmities. That was a year and six months before the atonement was ever made. Then if that be true, were many trying to argue against divine healing, then the atonement had more power before it came in force than it did after it's come in force. So you, and I can show anyone or any Bible reader where that Christ gave his church, whether it's called Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Pentecostal, whatever it is, he gave them power to heal the sick. Now, I'm asking for any man, any student, any Bible student or historian to produce to me one piece of Scripture where Jesus taken that power back from the church and told them they didn't have it anymore. He never took the power from the church. The church is afraid to exercise or to practice what Christ told them to do. Now to the critic, a few years ago you could make remarks, but now we have tens of thousands of documented statements by doctors, clinics, hospitals everywhere across the world of absolutely outstanding miracles of blind, deaf, dumb, raised from the dead when the doctor pronounced them dead, documented statements. So there's, they're, they're, the unbeliever's mouth is hushed. You don't hear much more of it, do you? Nothing to be said. Now, that doesn't belong just to the Pentecostal people. That doesn't belong just to a certain group or a certain man or an evangelist come by like myself or Mr. Roberts or 
some other man. That's to every believer. Not only to the pastor, but to the laity. To any man or woman that's born to the Spirit of God, that's got faith and healing, has a right to pray for the sick just with the same results that any other man would have. It's not, I am not a, one of the believers in the Nicolaitan taking all of the conquer the lady and put it all in the pastor. It's in the laity. The Holy Spirit just doesn't baptize the pastor, it baptizes the laity too. It's all in the laity. And pastor is just one of us. It means a shepherd pastor, which means a feeder of the flock. The Holy Spirit gives overseer to watch it and control it. Now, remember, if Jesus of Nazareth stood here on this platform tonight, wearing this suit that he gave me, and any of you precious people here would come to him and ask him to heal you, he could not do it. Now that seems strange, but he could not. Because he's already did it. You are redeemed. See? He would say, I, if you believe it, it's already. Someone said, I was healed. I was saved last week, Brother Brennan. I beg your pardon. No, I was saved ten years ago. No. You were saved 1900 years ago. When Christ died, he settled the sin question. And how can you ever preach salvation for the soul without preaching divine healing because that sickness is an attribute of sin. Before we had sin, we had no sickness and sickness came because of sin. Maybe not something you done, something you inherited. Today in the private interviews, which there's the place where you should see the Holy Spirit, there's men and women sitting here tonight that even the Holy Spirit goes plumb back today into three generations and brought down the people and told them their name and what they did and all about it and why this thing was on this person and took it off of them and healed them standing right in the room. Tell them their grandmother, their grandfather, who they were, where they come from, what they did. The third generation, they couldn't think, but the next generation brought out in the next generation and then then to them, of course they knew. He, he knows all things. Now, that did not heal the person, but it raised them to a place that they had faith to be healed. That's the reason we do an act. Why do we baptize? Water won't save you. But it's obeying an act. Taking the communion won't save you. But it's following the commandment. Your only beating on the altar won't heal you. Beating on the altar won't save you. You could be on the altar until you just went out of breath and, and died there. You'd still be unsaved until you accept and believe that Jesus died and you're still and you accept Him as your personal Savior. Every minister in here could lay hands on every sick person in here and pray for now until the day after tomorrow night. There'd never be one thing happen until you accept what Jesus did for you. So therefore, it doesn't lay and ministers in one another, but it lays in our own individual faith in a finished work that Christ did for us at Calvary. Right. Now, the first... Now, many people has called me a divine healer, and other men have it. Brethren, surely you know better than that. If you believe, if your pastor preaches salvation... And you get saved because salvation is in the Bible. And when you get saved under his preaching, does that make him a divine Savior? No more than make any other man a divine healer who preaches healing. That's right. Because we're only, we are confessing what Jesus said. And Jesus is the high priest of our confession setting at the right hand of God to make intercessions upon our confession. Amen. I know the King James says profess and confess. It's the same word. But uh, confession. And he cannot do anything for you 
until first you believe it, accept it, and confess that it's right. Then he's the high priest to make intercessions on what you confess that he has done for you. That's just as plain as I, I know the gospel. That's frankly that's that's all. I, that's the only gospel that there is. Is that now everybody that understands that. And another thing I want to say before I ask, I'll say again. Now, first, faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, that ought to be sufficient. It would be for me. It would be for you. If they don't believe your word, let them alone. But that isn't so with our Lord Jesus. No, it isn't so. He sends gifts in the church. There's no one can deny that gifts isn't in the church of the living God. First Corinthians 12 said there is nine spiritual gifts in everybody. And there's also uh, five spiritual offices in the church. First is apostles or missionaries. Both of them means, the word means one cent. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. They are all God's ordained gifts to the church. Pastors, evangelists, prophets, and missionaries or apostles into the church. Those are sent there and then nine spiritual gifts put in every local body. And why would some of you people, as great a church as a Presbyterian church, I have their folder, said, long has the Presbyterian church forgot the principles of the early church. We must get back into the Presbyterian church. Speakers with tongues, interpreters of tongues, gifts of healing, and the signs of the early church must again accompany the church, accompany the church or we'll never go any farther. God bless the man who wrote that. Amen. We've got to go back to the original beginning. We just denominated it and made man-made dogmas until we got the poor people till they don't know what to believe. It's a pitiful sign. Now, remember that what Christ was yesterday, he is today. And anyone knows that reads the Bible that his sign, that he proved to the people that he was the Messiah. How many knows what his Messiah sign was after this week's of teaching? Raise your hand. How many is here for your first time then? Oh, many... How he proved that he was a Messiah is because he was a prophet. For Moses said that he would be this prophet. Now, I'm going to speak and immediately, as quick as I can, we're coming in there to pray for the sick. Now remember, it's not just going to be my prayers, your prayers. And please, my friend that's come here sick and afflicted, very, very bad, Setting some of you in wheelchairs, some of you almost dying, I suppose, some sitting out there in the audience, not a chance to live outside of God. Just remember what I say here, I've got to meet you with that message at the day of the judgment and give an account for it. What good would it do me to be here away from my family and loved ones? What, what would I be doing here? Uh, I don't take money. It's not popularity. It's, uh, I don't, I shun that, you know it. So, wh what's it for? It's because that God told me, sent me, and showed me in the Scripture and confirmed it by an angel of the Lord that I was born to pray for sick people. And because I love God and love His children, that's why I'm here tonight. Exactly right. Now, at the judgment, we'll all meet that. There's probably 1,500 people in here tonight, I guess. Uh, that many? At, pardon? I'm, I'm a very poor counter. He said this around 1,900. I, I, I'd really make it There's so many evangelistic counts. It tries to make it so much bigger than what a crowd is. I have preached before 500,000 at one time at Bombay, India. And in Durban, South Africa, it was discussed where there was 150,000, 200,000. 
150, 200,000 people is nothing in them lands. In Thailand and places like that where you really the people come out and you see them by the tens of thousands and thousands. That, it doesn't mean the crowds don't mean anything. It's the faith that's in the individual that counts. Okay. Jesus could never help the audience of one of the uh, priests of the Caiaphases or some of those people. Neither could any of us in religious circles ever hold a meeting bigger than the Catholic Church. You know that. But it isn't in... We put too much stresses on how many people and try to boost up something. Don't boost up anything. Just, just be truthful about it. Tell the truth. Then you're always right. And when you're going to talk about healings, don't try to say, uh, I-, I got something in my hand. Feel it. Well, you might feel your hand. But healing's not in your hand. It's in Calvary. It's in your faith where it was finished at Calvary. And let the people... That's, and if you're a sinner, repent. Tell God that you're sorry you're a sinner and you're sick. Maybe sometimes you have to lay on your back so it'll get you to look up. See? And then get right with God and then everything will be all right. It, you're more apt to get healed if you'll do that. Now, I know it's hot and I'm going to try to be just as brief as I can so we can pray for the sick. Now, all you people that understands that it is your faith in Jesus Christ that healed you. Say amen. amen. Understood. Now, there's gifts in the Bible. And those gifts, what do they do? They only declare the presence of the one that made the gift. Now, if Jesus stood here tonight himself on the platform, and you knew that uh, he had come down from heaven, and you knew it was him, and he stood here, would it raise your faith? Sure it would. Well, he is here. You say, how do I know he is? Well, then if he does the same thing here in us, now he don't have any hands. How many knows that? No. He, his hand, your hands is his hand. We, he is the vine. We are the branches. And the, bre- the vine doesn't bear the fruit. The branch does. But if the branch is energized with the life of the vine, it'll do the same thing that he did. Then you know it's him. He said, a little while and the world sees me no more. Of course, the word there, cosmos, which means the world order. But ye shall see me, that's the believer, for I'll be with you, how long? To the end of the consummation, the end of the world. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now to the maybe spectators, I don't Hope there's none of them here tonight. But if there is, don't be a, just a spectator. Put your faith with these believers. Won't you do that tonight for the sake of these poor sick people? And remember, when Jesus came to his own country, listen what the scripture says. We hate to read it like this, but it says so. Many mighty works he could not do. You couldn't hardly think of Christ not being able to do it, but he couldn't. They could not do it because of their unbelief. What did he say to the boy with the epilepsy or to his father? I can if ye believe, for all things are possible to them that believe. What a joy it would be tonight to see man after man from these wheelchairs. Person after person laying here dying on these cots. Rise in the splendor of hell and walk out. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Those out there. Here sits a a young lady, a beautiful young lady. I've watched her last night sitting here. Sitting bound in a wheelchair. Here sits a little lad laying here with his stomach all wrapped down and his little hands and perhaps maybe his mother are fanning him. And how that mother's heart would jump for joy. How that little lady would feel to know that something had struck her. Uh, it don't have to happen spontaneously. No, no, no. Only thing has to happen is something happened in your heart that you believe it. And when you believe it, now there is such a thing as a mustard seed faith. You've heard Jesus speak of it. 
Now, a mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, which it was spoke of him. But why did he say that? You cannot hybrid, hybrid mustard. It won't cross with nothing. It, you can hybrid kale and get rest and, and so forth, but you, but you can't hybrid mustard. It won't cross. No, sir. It's genuine mustard. And if you've, just, if you've got great, big faith, a miracle will happen. But if you've got just a little bit of faith and it's genuine mustard seed, watch it bring you right on through every case and bring you right out. Amen. So, now, don't notice what happens to you now. But I want you to try to have miracle faith or faith to be healed. I'm going to have faith for you and do all that I can to help you to have faith, putting your faith out. I want us to bow our head just a moment and approach the author before we approach his word. Gracious Father, the hour has arrived that when we must bring this word to a showdown. We must bring God to a test as it is written in the book of Malachi, saith the Lord, Prove me, saith God. What a challenge. Prove me. It is written that we should prove all things. And we read in the Bible that it is written that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that he promised the church that what he did, they would do after him. We are told by the prophets that there would be a day that would not be night nor day, could be called neither, a dismal day, but in the evening time it should be light. Father, we know that civilization has traveled with the sun from the east coming westward, the early settlers and so forth. Now the east and west has met. The same sun that rises in the east sets in the west. We've had a day, Father, where we have done great things by your grace. We have led people to believe on you. Since that morning sun shone down upon the eastern people, and out of it came forth a Pentecostal-filled church with signs and wonders, with the Son of God living in them, on the eastern people. Now, the, them were the Jews and the Samaritans and the Greeks. But in the Gentile people is the Western people. And you said it shall be light in the evening time. We've had enough light in this dismal day to make great organizations and rise up great theologians, cause people to be born again of the Spirit of God. But you promised that that same sun would shine on the western people. And it would come to pass in this day that our Lord would make Himself known. Jesus promised it, just as He was then. And there would be a, a latter rain. And it would show forth and be like the former rain, and both former and latter rain would be together. We know we've had many bogus names and cults that's went out by it, under it. But still, the Word of God remains true. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray that your infallible words, which cannot fail, may you show yourself alive tonight among us by doing and performing the things that you did when you were on earth because you promised it. And you said when you were on earth, you did nothing except the Father showed you first. We pray that that will take place among us tonight and we will see the Lord God Jehovah, to which we are all worshipers of. May he come forth in his great power and will shine forth his glory in the ever gloomy heart. Bring forth Faith, life, we pray that every church that's represented here may go from here tonight with a fresh vision and a revival spirit break out into this country 
and in the schools, that there will be prayer day and night and hunger and thirsting. May the salt that seasons our life come tonight and make us all thirsty to be like him. We commit the service unto him now. The author who said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, may he come shining forth through his word. And then if the word shine forth in the people, and we'll praise him for it with humble hearts, bowed heads. In Jesus' name, his son, we ask it. Amen. And in the sacred readings of St. Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter and the 27th verse, I've selected this for a little drama for tonight. And I will ask that you will listen closely and quiet so that everyone in the back and around might hear because it's difficulty and the building hot. But I want to make it in a drama, uh, like the, this little fellow here and, and uh, the little ones could understand real plain. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of a good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. I want to take for a text, Be not afraid, it is I. Now it must have been about the time the sun was going down. It had been a terrible day, hot. The crowds had come from everywhere and had gathered. And all were tired and weary. And the sun was way sinking in the west. When the service ended, I can see the big brawny back of the big fisherman as he began to move the boat off of the little Galilean shore on the banks of the gravel as he pushed it into the water. And the people standing on the bank waving, bidding them all come back to see us again. And as soon as the boat was pushed out, called a ship in those days, which was a large boat that usually had a sail on it. And when the winds were blowing, they could make their travel faster by sail than they could by oar. And in the boat, there were uh, oarmen set on each side, and sometimes taking six or eight or maybe more oarmen to oar because it was really a fish boat. And this day the wind was quite as it usually does at the setting of the sun, and the blue Galilee was beautiful and calm. And as the little waves began to float, as the big fishermen climbed down through the midst of the brethren and sat down by the side of Andrew, his brother, picked up his oar, wiping the perspiration from his face, waved back to the audience again as the thousands stood on the bank waving and weeping for joy of what they had seen during the day. Every once in a while, the oarmen would stop and wave again as the ones on the bank waving, come back and see us again because our eyes have seen great things today. There's something about it that when people always want to look past the curtain where they come from and who they are and where they're going. And there's only one book of all the writings that we have that tell us that. That's this Bible. It tells us where we come from, who we are, and where we are going. And when they had seen the author of that Bible and had known that it was truly the Jehovah who created the creation... They were so happy about it, they were wanting them to come back again. And as they rode on through the the twilight 
And finally, so far out they couldn't see any farther than they were waving farewell. And perhaps the last farewell and they faded out of sight as the little ship uh, made its way with the little waves behind it as the oarman pushed it into the depths of the darkness of the Galilee. After rowing a while, it must have been the young John. Young man's usually full of enthusiasm. As a student, he stopped. It must have been he that stopped and said, Brethren, we are well out into the sea now. I'm beginning to get a little bit tired. So let's stop just for a moment and rest. And each man stopping, pulling the great oar into the boat, begin to wipe the perspiration from their forehead. Young John said for a moment, he said, Brethren, he must have said something like this, We can certainly rest assured that no matter what our priest has said and what the majority of the people think, we are not following some fanatic. We are following the Son of God. I was a little in doubt until today. But when I seen those 5,000 people longing to hear him speak a few words and had come out in that hot sun, them mothers with those little babies and how patiently they sat, the ones that had the cripple and the lame and the blind, fanning them, trying to hear what he had to say. Then when they, the question come for food, and we got this little boy that had probably played truant from school and had a little five biscuits and two little fishes, that he called and had them all to sit down. He might have said something like this, I climbed up on a rock behind him to just wonder what he'll do. Because I have somewhat in my heart believed it, but it's, it's been so real till I can hardly comprehend it to be a man that eat with us and slept with us and walked with us and talked with us and was just an ordinary man. And I noticed him when he took those biscuits in his hand, them little loaves, he broke them and handed them out to we brethren. And as soon as those hands reached back, there was another piece of bread growed on to that where he had broke off. I would like to ask the scientist teacher of this school, or whatever school, what kind of an atom did he turn loose? Not wheat, but wheat grown, milled, shortened, baked, and ready to eat. What did he do? And when he broke those fishes, a fish... Sarah, barn, raised, scale, clean, and fried, and was there in a second when he reached for it. What did he do? And when they taken five biscuits and fed five thousand people off of five biscuits and tuck up baskets for him. I can hear young John say, that took all of the doubt away from me. Because I remember that my Jewish mother used to tell me, oh, I can remember her pretty big brown eyes looking at me and saying, John, my son, I want to speak to you of something surreal that will mean something to you someday. Of all that you ever do, John, my ambitions is for you to be something great. But above all things, I want you to be a believer in Jehovah. 
As I and your father are and are trying to raise you. And I remember as a little boy when my little eyes would look up to hers and she'd say, John, when God Jehovah brought his people up out of Egypt, out into the wilderness where they had nothing to eat, Jehovah rained down bread out of heaven every night and fed all his children. And brethren, in this testimony meeting, I would ask my mother, Mother, has God got a whole lot of angels as professional bakers? And he's got a great big sky up there full of ovens. And every night he'd bake that bread and bring it down to the angels and lay it all out on the ground. Is that the way he done it, Mama? She'd say, no, John, you're just a little boy, so you do not understand. Jehovah is a creator. He just spoke the word and the bread came down. Now, my brethren, this afternoon, when I seen a man who eats with us at the table, who wears the same kind of clothes we wear, who cries when we cry, drinks at the same fountain we drink, has his ups and downs and frustrations as we do, but when I seen him take that biscuit and break it five thousand times, I know he was associated with Jehovah. He was that same Jehovah that my mother told me that brought bread out of heaven because sure he was doing the same thing that Jehovah done. He was not to me from his force, said John. He's more than a man. He's Jehovah. Because he does the works of Jehovah. And now do not we remember that he said, If I do not the works of my Father, then do not believe me. If you cannot believe my teaching, then believe the works that I do. And if I don't do the same works that Jehovah done, then believe me not. And there... He did the same work that Jehovah did, and only Jehovah could do it. So to man today who teach that he was nothing but a good man, or merely some prophet, that social gospel won't stand up. He was God, the Creator. Represented in a body that's called Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John said that settled it for me. Well, of course, you know, Simon, he's always got to put his part in too. He was an ignorant man, the Bible said, unlearned. He did not have an education. Fourth chapter of Acts says that, or the third chapter of Acts, I believe, said, that he and John both were both ignorant and unlearned. I've been told that he could not even sign his own name. But Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom because he had the revelation of who he was. He had a, something to say. He said, well, I can see him put his arm around Andrew, his brother, and... Say, Andrew, I remember when you used to come tell me about some wild-looking fellow coming out of the wilderness by the name of John that was uh, baptizing the people with the water, saying that a Messiah was coming. Well, now, of course, I could not believe such a thing as that. But one day Andrew persuaded me to... Come and listen to this man and to see if he really was the Messiah. And he said, I had been taught by my father. Now, I would just like to make a little statement here. Let's just dramatize him for a moment. 
I can hear Peter say, you know that I was a Pharisee. My father was one of the headmans of that Pharisee church. And my father told me one day when we got to Saini, Simon, we have made our living day by day off of this lake. Now, listen close. We made our living in Father and I and Mother and Andrew and all, so that we would catch fishes every morning. We prayed that God would give us our daily bread, give us our fishes. One day when Dad come in and set me up on the bow of the boat and said, Simon, my little boy, Daddy has always believed that someday the Messiah would come in my day. All of us Jewish people has looked for that. But perhaps I won't see him. I'm getting too old. But Simon, when he comes, there'll be a lot of stuff go out before he comes that'll cause the whole country to be confused. There'll be false messiahs and everything come. But Simon, I want you to be taught. Oh, how it would do good if we American people would teach our children such things. Instead of tap dancing and rock and roll and the stuff that we so uh, do today and just let them join the church but tell them what to look for. Now, said Simon, when he comes, our prophet Moses said that he will be a prophet. The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like an enemy and we as Hebrews are know to believe that God's word comes through the prophet and nothing else. Now, I want you to remember, Simon, when he comes, he will be this prophet. And when I walked up into his sight the first time, listen close. Simon testifying, I've got a testimony meeting out, out on the Galilee. And said, when I walked up first in his sight, when this man looked at me in the face, he said, your name is Simon, and you're the son of Jonas. Not only did he know my name, but he knew that godly old father of mine. That settled it to me. I know he was the Messiah. That finished it. For me. Philip said, Can I testify, brethren? So he said, I was standing and seen that. Now, Nathaniel, don't feel bad. But I run to tell Nathaniel because I know that Nathaniel was a Bible student. So I run around the mountain to find Nathaniel and I said, Nathaniel, come see who we have found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And he might have said this, Nathaniel, you know where I found you? Yes, I was under one of my fig trees praying. Yes. And he said, uh, come see who we have found. The S Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. That's the prophet that Moses told us would come. Ah, oh, now, said Nathaniel. Now, Philip, you, you've gone off on the deep end. Why, if the Messiah would come, he'd have to come to Caiaphas' first. Or he'd have to come to our church. If he, if he was real Messiah, you know he'd have to come to us, the Pharisees, that's all there is to it. But just to say he would come out of Nazareth, a bunch of holy... Oh, excuse me, I wouldn't have said that. Excuse me, I, I didn't mean that. Uh, he wouldn't come to a bunch of people like that. If he ever done anything, it would be amongst us smarter people if he did it. But you see, God does what He wants to. That's His business. And He said no one would come like that. He And Philip gave him one of the best answers that any man could do. He said, come see for yourself. Now that's a good idea. Don't stay home and criticize. Come find out from yourself and search the Scriptures. For the Messiah will certainly be scriptural. Come find out for yourself. And when on the road around, I can just hear them talking. And he said, you remember what? We went and got some fish that time. 
And the old fisherman could not sign his name to it. That fellow called Simon. Yes, I remember. When he walked up into the presence of this Messiah, he told him his name was Simon. And do you remember his daddy? Sure. What was his name? Jonas. All right. He said, you are the son of Jonas. Now, Nathaniel, you are a scriptural student. What will the Messiah be when he comes? He'll be a prophet. Well, does that fulfill it? Oh, yes, if he could do it, but I don't believe he'd do it. I hear Philip say, it wouldn't surprise me, but what he tells who you are when you come up. Walked up then, and they got into the presence of the Lord Jesus, and Jesus looked around and seen him. He said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. Now, you say, because he was dressed. No, all Easterners dressed the same. They had beard, turban, dark complected. He said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. He said, Rabbi, Rabbi means teacher. When did you ever see me? I'm a total stranger to you. When did you ever see me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, 15 miles around the mountain, I saw you. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You remember what the Pharisees and the teachers said standing there? said, this man's Beelzebub. He's a fortune teller. Jesus said, I forgive you for that. But someday the Holy Spirit's coming to do the same thing and you speak one word against it. It'll never be forgiven. That's today. Now, what a testimony. Then it must have been Andrew as I draw a little closer to my testimony. Andrew said, could I testify just a minute, brethren? You remember the day that now it's getting darker and darker. The evening star had come out. And, and so I uh, said, could I uh, uh, have a little testimony? Is the lady just going out? She has to be going out. She'll be back in a few moments. All right. I was going to say, if she, don't let her leave without being prayed for. We want everybody prayed for. So now said, um, do you remember... That day that Jesus, our Lord, said that uh, he had to go down to Jericho. Now, from Jerusalem to Jericho, if you've ever been there, is right down the mountain. But he had need go by Samaria. Why? The Jews had heard it, and the Samaritans hadn't heard it. Now, the Gentiles wasn't looking for no Christ. And let me say something right here to you, you sick people. He only comes to those who are looking for him. When you talk of him, like on the road from Emmaus, and he only comes to those who believe him. He will never have nothing to do with an unbeliever. Amen. He only comes, and Gentiles, we worship idols in them days. And there's only three races of people. That's Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. That's where the whole human race sprang from. And that's Jews, Gentiles, and Samaritans. Look at Peter with the keys. Opened it at Pentecost, opened it to the Samaritans, opened it at the Gentiles, and it's just free to the world. Now, and so, now we notice, said he sent us down into the city of Sacra there to get something to eat. Some victuals. And you remember when we come up, we were surprised. A woman with the mark of prostitution upon her was on her road to the well and there was no one there. So we thought we'd just see what she said to our master and see what he did when he met a woman. So we hid in the bushes. Now listen close to the the testimony. And the first thing that happened when he walked up, she walked up to let down the kettle, the pot for some water, started to raise up the uh, other pot like that. Why, he said, woman, bring me a drink. And we thought, well, but did we leave our Lord without a drink of water? And she said, well, we have segregation here. <laughs> uh, you Jews shouldn't ask Samaritan women such things as that. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I'd give you water. You don't come here to draw. I said, well, you have nothing to draw with. You remember the conversation went on and we were listening. And after a while, he looked her right straight in those big brown eyes of hers and said, go get your husband and come here. And the woman flatly denied him having a husband. And we thought, "Uh uh-oh, oh, here's a slip-up. Now what's he going to do? He tells the woman that she 
has a husband and go get her husband and she says she does not have a husband. You remember, brother, how we looked at one another? And then we noticed our Lord in his still manner as he looked her in the face and said, Thou hast said right. Because you've had five husbands and the one you're living with now is not your husband. And you said, Well... And that woman, did you remember, brethren, what she said? How much different her testimony was to the preachers of that day. The preacher said he's a fortune teller, a devil, the Elzebub. Anybody knows that fortune telling is of the devil. And that's the reason that Jesus said to speak that, uh, to call the Holy Spirit working, a fortune teller or a devil was blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and was unpardonable, calling the Spirit of God a devil. So then, he said, uh, that woman looked him in the face, and her in her condition, a sinner. I hope I don't hurt anyone, but I've got to say something. In a thing of prostitute, living with five husbands, six husbands, she know more about the Bible than half of the scholars in this nation know. What did she say? She looked straight at him and she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Not Beelzebub, like the preacher said, but a prophet. Said, We know, we Samaritans, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us all these things. That's a sign of the Messiah. When he comes, we know Jesus, who, uh, me, uh, Messiah, who's called the Christ, he'll tell us these things. That's a sign of following him because he's a prophet. You must be a prophet also. But the Messiah, we haven't had a prophet for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, but when he comes, he will tell us these things. You must be one of his servants. Jesus said, and the only one that ever could say it or ever will say it, he said, I am he. Whom you're looking at, I am that Messiah. She dropped that water pot. She had something more interesting than in the water pot. Into the city she went, and here's what she said to the man of the city. Come see a man that told me the things that I have done. Isn't that the very Messiah? What would they say today? Mental telepathy. Psychologist. Mind reader. Fortune teller. No wonder we got an atomic bomb with her name on it. You've got the spurn... You've got to spurn mercy, and there's nothing left but judgment after you spurn mercy. That's right. That's right. You step over the borderline. Right. You do it so simple. Many people think you have to do something great. Why, well, they don't only know who John was. You never know who, who, who to tell her dead. He comes to the elected church, and that's the only one that knows him. I challenge you to go back to the Bible and find any prophet that they didn't do the same thing. Jesus, they didn't know who he was until he was dead, buried, and rose again. That's right. Let me ask you Catholic people something. What about your, your saints? What about Joan of Arc? You were so infallible. What did your priest do to that woman? She was a prophetess. She saw visions. She prayed for the sick and they were healed. And what did your church do? You affirmed her to the state as a witch. Right. Oh, of course, you've seen your mistake 150 years later, and you've done repentance, dig up that priest's body and throw it in the river. That's a lot of repentance. It goes right over the head of the wise and prudent until it's passed, and then they're already in judgment. Let me say to you, church, the true Holy Spirit is here. In this nation tonight, in this world tonight, don't you let it pass over your head. Recognize it now. Healing's here for you. The Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins, all the benefits of Calvary is for you. Don't pass it by. Don't close yourself in on some denominational doctrine and forget to look at the Bible. See if this isn't the day that we're supposed to see these things? Don't notice a bunch of illiterate...
preachers, maybe like myself, who's trying to explain it. But look at what the Bible says and watch what it does. If it's the Spirit of God, it'll act like the Spirit of God. It'll do the things the Spirit of God did. If it doesn't, then it's not the Spirit of God. If I preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is raised from the dead and God doesn't confirm that with the same works that Jesus did, then I'm a liar. But if I, if I preach that message and God turns around and does the same thing, if I don't even have a, a grammar school education, what difference does that make? It's God using something. He can use a stick if He wants to. Amen. He can use anything He wishes. God. Now, let's let one more testify, will you? It must have been Brother Matthew. But I know it's getting a little late, brethren, but let's, let me testify. Said, do you remember when we got out of Jericho that day? You remember that little brother Zacchaeus down there? He was a businessman, a tax collector. We always thought he was a little shyster. Excuse that expression. I didn't mean it that way. Just a little renegade. But you know, our sister Rebecca... She was a believer on it. She believed the Lord Jesus. And you remember how she asked all the women to pray down in Jericho when we heard of Jesus going down to hold a campaign? And uh, when he got down there in Jericho, little Zacchaeus told us later, you know, one morning he got up early, he knew Jesus was coming, so he went out there and he was a little bitty short fellow. So he stood up at the gate where he's to come into the south gate. And he noticed he was too little, he couldn't see him. He said, Whenever I see that fellow, I'm going to give that holy roller a piece of my mind. Remember, he was called a heretic. He was called an insane person. We know that you're mad and have a devil. Is that right? What does mad mean? Crazy. We know that you're a Samaritan. You're crazy. you got a devil on you. That's what's doing all these things. You're a devil and mad. You don't join our organization, so we know you're a devil. Now, that spirit still lives. Now, we notice that he said, I'll just wait. Rabbi Lebinsky, I hope there's not a Rabbi Lebinsky here. No, Jehovah just expects you to come on church and pay your tithes and live a good life and that's all. Don't look. That Messiah may be a million years from now. Might not even come at all. There's a lot of Bible schools that they teach that the physical. I believe it's 80-something percent of the so-called Christians don't believe in the physical return of Jesus. I heard it. I got some government statistics there of the different denominations. And I think it's worse than that that don't believe in the virgin birth. How can anything happen? How can we build a revival in this nation? When you take the virgin birth out of Christianity, you got the foundation from under it. If he was a blood of a man, then he's no more than I am, or you are. But he's the blood of God. God, Holy Spirit, overshadowed the virgin and created a blood cell, and that's the blood of God. The Bible said we are saved through the blood of God. Not a man, God. But they deny it. So little Zacchaeus, a little bitty short fellow, he said, you got up that morning, let's give him a little drama for this little girl sitting here. Watch him. Hair, little bright eyes, and little hair combed down. Now I can imagine seeing, you know, Rebecca, his wife, she believed Jesus. So she was just praying all the time, oh Jesus, I pray thee that whenever he comes into the town here, that my darling little husband, he's a good man, but he's just all tied up with them, all kind of Kiwanis meetings and lodge parties and all these things. I ain't saying nothing on Kiwanis. Now, that's all right. See, I just uh, some people take calls. I, I believe that the Masons are all right, but the Mason Lodge will never take the place of the church or the blood of Jesus Christ. All my people are Masons. And now they're all right as a lodge, but it won't take the place of the church. And the trouble of it is you've got the church to it's no more than the Masonic Lodge or any other lodge. The church is a house of God where Christ lives and manifests himself amongst the people. That's right. Notice. So Zacchaeus, see, I see what they're saying. Now here, they're climbing all over the gates and everything else. I, I never seen. 
So I'm going down here. I know he always goes down Hallelujah Street. He still does. And he turns on Glory Avenue. And so I'm going down that corner and wait for him. So he goes down there and has his best garment on, you know. He stands down on the corner with his best garment all groomed up, you know. Wait till I see that there's so-called prophet from Galilee. I'll tell him a piece of my mind when I see him. You don't know how many degrees I got. And my good friend, the rabbi, has taught me a lot of things. I'll tell him something. And I'll tell him if he don't quit with his witchcraft around my wife, I'm going to do something to him. I'll give him a piece of my mind. I have my wife out there on them long night prayer meetings and things. Oh, sir, she's left the club. She quit playing cards. She's done all night. Got all the, the rabbi's wife and all them all, or these other people all tore up. I'll tell you, with that fanaticism, I'll tell him on the team. Stand there, groom his little self. He thought, wait a minute. That crowd will follow him. That's right. They usually do. That crowd will follow him. So if he comes up here, well, I'll be no better off than it was down there. So he says, you know what? I believe I'll do. There's a sycamore tree standing there. So I believe I'll just get up there. When I get up in that tree, I'll tell him when he passes by. So he looks around and says, there's set the city garbage can sitting there. Well, maybe if I could get that over here, I can't shinny up the tree. Shinny, I, I meant climb up the tree. See? Um, excuse my length of my... I'm just a Kentuckian. So, so he goes over, he gets his arm, I, I backs off. You know, my, I got on my best clothes. How can I, I... I couldn't be caught with that garbage can. But there's something other about it. If you're trying to see Jesus, <laughs> you'll manage some way to see him. <laughs> You'll do things you didn't think you did. You didn't think you'd ever do it, but you do it anyhow. If you want to see Jesus. You lay where some of these people are and you'll just lose all that old prestige. So he slips over, holds his nose, and gets the garbage pail. You understand, honey? Here he comes over, you old packet. And he happens to look up and here's his competitor saying, Well, you know what? There's Zacchaeus. He's working for the city now. The garbage is full. Well, he was determined to see Jesus, so he didn't care. Maybe some of y'all might feel the same way. Some doctor divinity set back here and said, I wouldn't want to be caught amongst this bunch of people, but you're exposed now. <laughs> you're ruined now. But if you're determined to see Jesus, you don't care anyhow. That's right. That's right. You don't care anyhow. Here he comes with the garbage paper. Walks over and sets it down with the tree and shinnies up the tree and gets up there, sets up there, picks splinters out of his hand, wipes the garbage off his new clothes. But he wants to see Jesus. He said, you know what? I remember Rebecca told me that that guy was a prophet. Now, I believe there's a hoax in that somewhere. They still believe the same thing. There's a hoax in it somewhere. Those disciples, somehow, they work it up among them. Some other they go get somebody that he knows and he tells them them things. So, I, I know, you know what? I will tell you what I'll do. I'm just going to hide from that fellow. So, he sat down where two limbs meet. And you know that's a good place for you to sit a while, where two ways meets, yours and God's. Make your decision from there. So he sat down on this limb, and he reached over and got some of the big sycamore. Sycamore actually was an olive tree. So he just pulled over the, and covered himself all up everywhere. He said, you'll never see me sitting up here. But I'm going to get a look at him when he comes by. He covers himself all over it, and he leaves one big leaf there so he can raise it up and look out. Like this. So he said, sir, and he said, now I'll be able to know because somehow or another, everywhere he's at, there's a lot of noise. You know, that hasn't changed. You know? Where Jesus is, there's usually a lot of noise. So he said, I'll hear the noise coming a long time before he gets there. So after a while, he heard the noise. And he don't come in front, great, big, sturdy fellow, Simon Peter said, would you stand aside? We're very sorry. Our master's tired. He preached all night, almost last night. He healed many of the sick. Would you stand aside, please? We're sorry. People with their children, well, would you just stand aside, please? Our master's got to have his breakfast yet this morning. Would you just stand aside? So Zacchaeus said, that ain't him. That's that old ignorant fisherman up there I used to buy fish from. That ain't him. So about that time, he said he must be a great, big, princely guy with a crown on his head, walking, spurting, you know. You know, I hate to see anybody put on a dog. That's a stuffed shirt. That's that's not a dog. So here, but they notice when he come along, a little humble fella, 
Not with his collar turned around in the back and turbans on top of his head, but he was just an ordinary man, dressed like an ordinary man. So as he come walking by, Zacchaeus pulled his leaf down and said, You know, there's just something about that man that I like. You can never get a glimpse of him but what you love him. I don't care who he is. I know the first time I took a look, by faith I saw him, what he was. Put my hands on his feet. Seen him dying there for me and looking down to me. Oh, that was enough. Zacchaeus pulled his leaf down and said, Oh, as he come close now, he can't see me. He won't know I'm here. Now, he don't know because he, he'd see me up here, but he can't see me because I'm all covered up. I'm in this tree and a little bitty fellow sitting up on this limb here. Now, I'll watch him. So, we noticed him. He come walking just in this ordinary manner, walking quietly. Walks down. I can see little old Zacchaeus looking around the tree leaf like this, you know, looking as he come by. When he just got passed by, he raised his leaf up. Jesus stopped. Said, Zacchaeus, come down. Going home with you for dinner. Not only knew he was up there, but knowing what his name was. Amen. That settled it. Well, and he said, you remember when we was going out the gate, blind Barnabas? When blind Barnabas said he'd been sitting there thinking about how that the, that the Messiah would be when he'd come and so forth. And how that if the prophets lived, he'd go by and ask them for to receive his sight. And all at once he heard uh, the coming by of the howling mob. There he were again. And he was sitting there shivering in the cold. You remember his testimony? And he said, he said, who goes by? And so everybody said, oh, shut up. And he heard somebody holler, hey, hey, you, you, the Galilean prophet, you, we hear you raise the dead. It was a priest. He said, we've got a whole graveyard full of them up here. Come up and raise one for us. We'll believe you. <laughs> that same old devil still lives. You know. <laughs> we heard you raise the dead. we got a graveyard full of righteous men dead up here. Come raise one of them. We'll believe you. Never bothered him a bit. He just kept walking on. The souls of the world was resting up on him is going to Calvary. Going up the hill. Barney may have said, Who passes and they shove him down? And after a while, some nice courteous lady come by and said, Oh, poor fellow. Said, oh, I said, Who's passing, lady? Oh, she said, Don't you know who it is? Said, It's Jesus of Nazareth. No, I don't know who Jesus of Nazareth. The Galilean prophet... No, I never heard there was such a person. You know who the son of David is coming to be? Oh, the Messiah? Yes. Oh, if I could have only seen him. Or how do you know it is? I'm one of his followers. And I want to say something here. His followers always show courtesy to everybody. Amen. You know, they're ready to help somebody. Ready to do something for somebody else. His true followers. And said, yes. And it might have been, let's say it was Rebecca. My husband had just saved a while ago and I'm so full of joy. Well, now, you mean that that is the Messiah that we were taught was to come? The prophet that Moses said? How far is he? Now, if he was ever there and look where he was supposed to be sitting, he was a good 250 yards away with about four or 5,000 people screaming, Hosanna to the prophet! Hosanna to the prophet! Away with him! And throwing over right through that and things like that. All those kind of things. How could he have ever heard? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy! Thou son of David, have mercy. So let's think it. Barnabas thought this. If he is that Messiah, he's a prophet. I can just see him kneel down on his knees. He's shivering and saying, Oh, Jehovah, you're a Messiah. And I've wanted him to see all my life. And if that's him passing by, let me touch him, Lord. I can't get to him. But can my faith reach him? Oh, let me touch him, Lord. By that time, Jesus stopped and said, Bring him here. He couldn't have heard him. He's too far away from him all that howling month. But his faith stopped him. And look where he was going. To Jerusalem with the sins of the world. But look, the faith of one blind beggar. Amen. Stopped him. And the faith of one person here tonight will bring you from glory down here to do the same thing. Oh, we could go on for testimony, but I've got to hurry. Yes, I'm past time. Just let me wind up one more little statement. They were testifying. You know what? While them brothers was testifying, 
the devil happened to look over the banisters over there somewhere or over across the hill and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, I got them now. They went off without him. And that's what the church has done today. We've had such big building programs, so much money, so much passions, trying to pattern after the next people till I'm afraid we've gone off without him. Our lives prove it. Gone off without him. Devil says, now I can get him. So he began to blow his poison breath. The sea began to go plumb to the bottom of big waves leaking up. That's what he does today. When he sees you go off without a church, just with a bunch of cold formal theology, an amen would cause somebody to stretch their head around and wonder what happened. No spirit, no more all-night prayer meetings, no more burden for the sick, no more burden for the dying, no more burden for the sinners. Then he begins to blow his paws and breath, saying, and the days of miracles is past. He begins to whip the little boat from side to side. Is it real? Could it be real? Maybe we've been wrong. Maybe our fathers who said to receive the Holy Ghost. Maybe it's wrong. Wesley could have been a little out of his head. Luther could have been wrong also. Knox, Calvin, all those fellows. And John Wesley preached divine healing and believed in divine healing and practiced divine healing. Every time we ever had a revival, any time through the history, it started with divine healing. That's right. See if Luther didn't heal. The rest of them all the way down practiced divine healing. Then they organize it and then the winds begin to blow. Because when you organize it, you go off without him. And you got your own theology then. See. If you make your doctrine and end it with a comma, we believe this plus as much as the God will reveal to me, that's all right. But when you write up your doctrine, you end it with a period. We believe this and that only. Then you shut God from out of the thing. God just keeps moving on. He just moved the pillar of fire. As soon as Luther saw it, he'd come out of the Catholic Church. What did they do after Luther's death? They built an organization under it. The far left. John Wesley saw it. He owned sanctification. He went out after it. Left Luther. Left the Anglins. And went out after it. What did they do after Wesley and Asbury and them died? They made an organization. God pulled right straight out and went to the Pentecostals. Here they saw it. The way they went with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What did you all do? Organize it. He's pulling it right away from you. Going 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 some of the finest people in the world is in these churches, but the system of the thing, you see, is what gets it. Find people in a Catholic church, but it's the system that keeps them from serving God. Now, he saw them, and there they was, tossed about, all hopes gone. That's where you're laying. Where you're laying. This poor mortal laying here, just about dead. That little baby, you out there at the heart trouble with cancer, that's where you're at. Just all hopes about gone. But you know what? In all of our sin and all of our difference, let me give this encouraging word before we pray. He hadn't left him. He climbed the highest mountain there was. So he could watch him all the way across. He's sitting up there watching. When he died at Calvary, brethren, he never left us. He climbed the hill of Calvary on and above the moon and stars on and above the milky white way until he sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. And his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he's watching us tonight. He had gone so far. He's seen him in trouble. He saw the devil is about ready to get him. He sees the devil is about ready to get you all. He sees it's just about ready. You're going to a premature grave. Some of these going as a sinner if you don't repent. Some of these will go premature because Satan's sickness is setting and ripping the life out of you. But remember, he's sitting on high watching, waiting to confirm his word. He watches over to confirm it. Is that right? What happened when the oars had broke, the mast pole had fell, the little ship was waterlogged. That's about like our churches are tonight. Waterlogged. Busting about all kinds of baptisms and everything else. We're waterlogged. Baptizing this way, sprinkling, pouring, fussing, arguing, carrying on the oars is broken, the sails are gone, and there's no more rushing wind to come. It couldn't blow us anywhere. <laughs> there you are. See, all gone. 
But here he come walking on the water. Oh, my. Walking on the water. And what did the disciples think when they saw him come walking? They thought he was a spook. They said, oh, it's a ghost. Oh, we're scared. We're afraid him to get crowded. Oh, it's spooky. Don't have nothing to do with it. It's, 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 it's mental telepathy. It, it, it's fortune telling. Just as they did then, so do they do now. That's right. Same thing. Afraid of it. Well, our church don't teach that. I'm afraid of it. But the Bible teaches that. If he could speak tonight, you know what he'd say? Be not afraid. It is I. And if it's him, he'll do his same works. Jesus said, if I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. But if I do the works of my Father, then believe the works. If I told you, listen to the closing, if I told you the spirit of an artist was in me, well, you'd expect me to go out here and paint a picture like the artist, if that spirit's in me. Is that right? If I told you the spirit of a mechanic was in me, you'd expect me to understand almost the beat of that motor, what was wrong. If I told you the spirit of John Dillinger's in me, I'd have guns and be dangerous to stand before me, if that spirit was in me. If I told you the spirit of Jesus Christ was in me, then I'll do the works of Jesus Christ. So in this church. Because that's his life, isn't it? Now, what he was then and what them people testified of, if he will do that same thing tonight, would you realize that your faith has called him from glory to this building tonight? Will you accept it? Then what would you say? Be not afraid. That's what he'd say. It's I. Some of you say, what is it, Brother Brandon? I, I, every night when this meeting starts, I feel him say, you know, I believe he's reading their mind. One says telepathy. One says nonsense. Brother, you're only sealing your own doom. If he could speak yourself, uh, if that isn't the same word, he, how many knows that Jesus Christ is the Word of God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Is that right? How many knows that Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the Bible said that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. That's preaching slasher down, cutting both two-edged, coming and going. Some people think humility is something that ought to wear a skirt. No, no. You, know, you misunderstand that. Jesus, the humblest man that ever lived, he could flat ropes together and look on them with anger and run them out of the temple. That's right. Certainly. You say he had compassion. He did. Why did he pass through thousands of people that were lame, blind, halt, withered, and found a man laying on a pallet? Maybe he had prostrate trouble. He could walk. He said, when I'm coming down, somebody beats me. He wasn't going to kill him. He had it 38 years. And the Bible said he passed through great multitudes of lame, blind, halt, and withered. Is that right, brother? A compassionate God. Passing through that kind of people and found a man laying on a pallet. How many knows what a pallet is? I was raised on one. See. So then you laid on this pallet. And there he was laying there. And Jesus looked around until he found him. And the Bible said that he knew he had been in this condition. And he said, well, thou be made whole. Why not the twisted man? What about that woman there with the dying baby? What about these? Why, what about them? Well, thou be made whole. He said, I have no one to put me in the water. I want to come in somebody's steps down. Jesus said, you've had that for 38 years. That's right. All right, take up your bed and go into your house. And you ever question? You just picked up the bed and went walking on. Is that right? Yeah. And the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin court, the church, questioning. Why are all the rest of these? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I can't. The Son does nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. That's compassion. Compassion is follow the will of God. Not human sympathy, but compassion. Oh, it's two different words altogether, sympathy and compassion. See, if it wasn't, Jesus sir made a rude mistake when he did that. See? So you must realize that the compassion of Christ, again, he has healed every one of you. You're all free. If you can believe it. Now, do you believe this is the word of God, that that's exactly what Jesus done, what they were testifying about? Raise your hand. Now, 
if he was standing here, the one who wrote the word, if he was standing here and would tell you and prove to you that he was standing right here on the platform, would you be willing to accept him and say, that settles it for me. Huh? If he's standing here and wrote the word and said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. And the works that I do shall they do also. Is that right? St. John 14, 7, 14, 8. The works that I do. Now, here's a broad challenge before, as the brother said, 1,900 people. Here lays a Bible on the desk. Here's two or three sheets of paper of some kind. of something I don't know what even's on them. They belong to some of the brethren here. Here's the Bible. There's 1,900 people. There's not a person here that I know. I can't see one living human being that I know in that audience. If you're all strangers to me, raise your hand. I'd like to even maybe if I had time to have this minister who was on one of the private interviews this morning. Let him stand and tell you what the Holy Spirit did up there this morning. Beyond a shadow of doubt, what he did and went back and brought out and showed and revealed. And <clears throat> but if you believe that Jesus Christ dwells in his people, look, all that God was, he poured into Christ. You believe that? In Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You believe that? Because He was He was He was God and was, He was the Son of God, but yet He was God. God changed His cast from the Spirit and stretched His tent and began He become us. He become us that we through His grace might become Him. Amen. Brother, should he get that? See, God was made flesh so we could. First Timothy three sixteen. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifest in the flesh, and believed on the world, and gone, received up in the glory. God made manifest. God was in Christ reconciling the world into. So all that God was, He poured into Jesus, and all that Jesus was, He poured into the church. Amen. So that's the reason He commissioned us. To baptize. Say, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Why? Not three different gods, but three offices of the same God. The Fatherhood, the Sonship, the Holy Ghost dispensation. Amen. Now, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's God. Not three or four or five different gods, but one God manifested in three manifestations of one God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Trinity. Now, we notice... That same God then that was in the pillar of fire was the same one that was in Jesus because he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am the rock that was in the wilderness. And he said, I come from God and I go to God. That day you'll know that I am the Father, Father, me, and I, and you, you, and me. There we are all together. God in us. God in you. That same God. The trouble it is you can't cost the people, you Baptist, you Methodist, you fail to recognize your God-given privilege. Amen. Hear me, thus saith the Lord. You believe it with all your heart. Promised it in the last day. Hasn't been for 2,000 years because the Bible said it wouldn't be. But Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom when that angel comes, turned his back to the tent and asked for Sarah and told what she said in the building. How many knows that? Yeah. Jesus said, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. When? Just before Sodom burned. That's just before this world's going to burn. The whole unbelieving world will be going to chaos and burn with fervent heat. We know that. And just before that time, remember, thus saith the Holy Spirit, this is your last sign. Write it in your Bible. And if something rises besides this and greater than this, call me a false prophet. That's quite a statement. I watch what I say. I'm in contact with better than 10 million people around the world. So I have to say that, and I know I didn't say that myself. Now he's here. I can't heal you. I have nothing to heal you with. But the one that has healed you is here trying to get you to believe it and accept it. Yeah. Now, I asked you as my brother and my sister, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, believe this gospel message. And if you don't want to believe me because I don't belong to your denomination, I don't belong to any denomination, I am a Methodist. I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal Methodist Nazarene Pilgrim Holiness. <laughs> See? I'm your brother. I'm a Mennonite Amish. I'm, I'm all that, see. I, I, I'm your brother, see. I'm the assembly of the Church of God. Everywhere you find brother to help your people around the world is sponsor my meetings and stay behind me in foreign fields and back me up. Brother, I'm right here to represent. I'm your brother. I'm, I'm for you 100%. I'm happy for you tonight in this great dark hour to know that you're a man and women of God sitting here to represent this great gospel that we're preaching. Don't be ashamed, brother. You've got the truth. Stay with it. Don't divvy from it right or left. Stay right with it. How many out there that doesn't have prayer cards that's sick? Let's see you raise your hand wherever you are. There was a woman in the Bible, as we said, and I didn't have a prayer card, but she said, I believe that story about that man. If I can touch his garment, I'll be made whole. I mean, know that story. When she touched him, she went out and sat down. And Jesus said, who touched me? And Peter rebuked him, saying, everybody's touched. He said, but I got weak. I mean, know that that virtue means straight, weak. You got weak, that's what you can't go. Soon, here it comes again. I'll be leaving the field. My ministry's going to change. I can't be evangelist and a seer at the same time that builds the people under a fossil. Why? Now, my, I wish that wouldn't do that. But look, now in this audience for tonight, if God will show one sign like that, that He is here with us. Will all of you believe it with all your heart? Amen. Then, if that woman touched His garment, and then He turned around and told her that she had a blood issue, and said, Peter said, I did it. He said, your faith did it. Is that right? Amen. Now it's going to be your faith that does it. Is that right? Amen. Your faith that does it. Now, have you noticed your clergymen and your ministers tonight? Each night they stood up here behind me to pray for me instead of getting out there to be called in the line. Several of them already healed, I know it. They're sick too, they're needy, but they prefer their congregation first. That's shepherds. How <clears throat> you believe? Now, how many knows that he's that same high priest tonight that he was then? Where is he at? Sitting at the right hand of the Father. Is that right? A high priest that can be touched by what? The feeling of our infirmity. Is that true? Can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. All right? If he can be touched and he's the same high priest, how would he act tonight if you touched him the same way he did then? Is that right? Everybody believe that? Say it. Raise your hand. All right, everyone. All right? Now... I'm just going to wait a moment. I'm waiting for the audience to get quiet. Ready. The Holy Spirit is so tender. Oh, just one little thing. He'll, he'll go away. He just leaves. Then I have to walk away. You believe. Now you people I say that don't have a prayer card, raise up your hand. I think there's no prayer. I don't think you get out any prayer cards either. We're going to give them out tomorrow or Sunday. One for Sunday afternoon service. Or tomorrow whenever the Lord will leave. Now you pray. You say, high priest. Not William Branham. William Branham's a man. <laughs> Sinner saved by grace. Just like you are. But Lord, I believe the man told me the truth. It's the Bible. He tells me that this is the day that God promised it. I want some of you people that's not crippled. First, well, then we get to the cripples afterwards. Now if I look over here, say, this little girl, she's crippled. I see this little boy here at this break on his leg. I might guess that they probably had polio did that. Oh, sure, anybody can look at that. See, 
This boy's crippled. This woman's crippled. Sure. Anybody sees that. Certainly. That wouldn't be no miracle. But what about you out there looks good and healthy? That's the one. That's the one. You pray. Our Heavenly Father, there's a bunch of handkerchiefs laying here. And they represent the sick people. And they bring these because in the Bible they took from the body of Paul. Handkerchiefs and aprons. And the Bible said that unclean spirits went out of them. Devils left them. They were healed. These people in another age believed the same because they had seen you moving in, Paul. They knew that he was your servant. And Paul has gone long ago, Lord, to glory. But you're still the same Holy Spirit that was on him. You promised that you'd do the same thing. And you're doing it. Now one writer said that when Israel was cut off from the promised land and the Red Sea was holding it back, that God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes. And that Red Sea got scared. And it moved back. And the children of Israel passed over into the promised land. Now Lord... Look tonight to the blood of Jesus. And every one of these handkerchiefs, when they're laid on the people, may that devil get scared and move back. May that sick person cross into that good promise of divine healing. As you said, above all things, I will you cross for help. Grant it, Lord. Through Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Now, as we're studying, I want everyone reverently and quietly, irreverently, be quiet, just be in prayer. And in your heart, say, Lord Jesus, let me touch your garment. I know Brother Bram doesn't know me. He has no idea who I am or where I am or nothing about me. But if you'll just turn, and he tells me that... We read word that people are born in the world for certain things, for certain ages. He said, since a little bitty baby boy, we've heard these things come. That, uh, if you just let me touch your garment, then you speak to you, Brother Bram. Let him tell me what I'm praying about, what I'm here for, what something or other. I'll believe you. Just say that. Say, I'm not doubting, Lord, but I'm in need. You just have faith and believe. Just we're waiting, humbly, sweetly waiting. Nobody pressing now. Just be, just relax yourself. Now, if everyone can see what I see, if you want to look, there's a man sitting right back there. He's got heart trouble for one thing. Another thing, he's got a blood clot on his chest. I believe he'll miss it. He's from Michigan. Mr. Hannah. Stand up on your feet, sir. Receive your healing. Jesus Christ makes you well. While you're on your feet, sir, are you and I strangers one another raise up your hand? Those things that was said, everything was said was true, wave your hand like this to the audience. Wasn't you praying for God to touch you, the high priest? If that's right, wave your hand like this. You are healed. Forty feet away from me, what did he touch? What did he touch? Does that make the Bible true, Amen. brethren? Amen. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Do you believe it? Amen. Now someone else somewhere pray. I can only say as I watch that light and feel your spirit growing. It's not my selection, it's the Father's. I just speak... But if I do not the works of Jesus Christ, then I'm not his witness. 
I don't have to do that. That's my ministry. These men don't have to do that. They won't. There's not, and I'll say this in the name of the Lord, there has not been or will not be till I'm gone. It's exactly what he told me when he ordained it. The man sitting right back here shattered to death. Just had a cancer operation, but it wasn't no good. Mr. Holt, uh -huh. stand on your feet and believe. Am I a stranger to you, sir? Raise up your hand. Are those things right? Everything right? Wave your hand like this if that's right. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go be well. Believe with all your heart. Cancer spirit somewhere. You just feel it's the devil's shadow. It's not me. Are you quit thinking that? It's not me. It's him. Here. Look right now. Can't you see that light, brother? Look stand right there, see? It's right over that man sitting there, that red towel. The man has leukemia. That's right, stand on your feet, sir. If you're sitting there praying for that, stand on your feet if those things are right. Are we strangers to one another? Wave your hand back and forth. The things that were told you are right, wave your hand again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be healed. Glory, Look, look here. See this lady sitting right here? You're praying for that baby. Baby can't live on her outside of God. You believe me to be God's prophet, his servant. I'll tell you what's wrong with the baby and you believe it'll get well. If you're in contact enough to leave, the baby has a hole in its heart. Glory to God. That's right, raise up your hand, sister. That's true. That's true. You believe now? Put your hand on it this way you got it. God, I'll rebuke that devil. Let that baby be. In the name of Jesus Christ. Here, this woman was so sick. This lady laying here. Look around this way, sister. Right here. You seem to be the sickest one of the group. You were praying. You believe me to be his prophet, his servant? I see a wheelchair somewhere. That man sitting right there. He's had a stroke. He's a preacher. His name's Mr. Ferguson. You believe on the Lord Jesus. I do not heal people. Excuse me, lady. I had to follow it. I wanted you so safe. Serve me. Your sister's here watching you. She loves you. You're shattered to death. You know that. You can't live outside of God. Males know that, don't they? You come from males. You've been males up there. Males plenty. Cancer killing you. They brought you down here for this meeting. That is true. Your sister can witness that. I can hear you. But let me ask you something. There was three lepers one time set at a gate. When Samaria was being besieged by the Syrians, they said, Why do we sit here till we die? If we stay here, we're sure to die. If we go into the city, we're going to die anyhow because we're eating one of those children in there. But said, What if we go down to the camp of the enemy? If they kill us, we just die anyhow. But if, we, if we're saved alive, we live. God honored that, didn't He? And they were saved and saved. You're sitting in the same place. 
Mabel's turned you down, Miss Mason. Strange under you, who you are. Now, but I'll ask me to turn you down, there's nothing he can do for you. If you lay there, you'll die. If you go to Mabel, you'll die. You're not asked to go to an enemy's house. You're looking to become to the house of the Father tonight and to you. You believe with all your heart, I'll rise up and take that stretcher and walk out of here and go home. Yeah. What about you, lady? You're now on that stretcher looking this way. You believe in his promise? Yes. Yeah. You believe with all your that old flying You believe? You believe in God's promise? Then rise up out of there.